Hello, everyone, and we are here at Craft Conversations, and today I have joining me Claire Fowler. Uh, Claire, how are you today? I'm pretty good today. I'm better than the weather, I'll say that. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like, the joys of St. John's, like, you never know which season you're going to have on the day. <laughs> <laughs> got to be prepared for all of them every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, Claire, I know that you have, like, a lot of uh, different backgrounds, and, like, you became a craftsperson. Uh, so why don't you start by talking about yourself so we know who you are? Well, my name is Claire. Um, currently, I am a mom. I'm a wife. Um, I also have a full-time job. Um, my background is kind of all over the place because I'm one of those people who, it's not that I don't settle, but I'm constantly exploring. I'm constantly, if left to my own devices, I'd be a perpetual student. Like I would have just stayed in school and moved in and out of whatever I found curious or wanted to learn at the time. So right out of high school, I did a quality assurance program at the Marine Institute. And so I worked with Fishery Products International for a while. And then I worked with Country Ribbon for a while. Then I moved to Ontario and I did a program called Coropity at the Michener Institute. And so that was allied health, healthcare um, of the lower limb. So I did everything from biomechanics to wound care to some soft tissue surgeries to all of that. Um, and then when I became, got pregnant with my son, um, I recognized that I needed to make a shift because the, as much as I loved that job, I found it hard to leave it at work. And I'm, and I'm sure a lot of people can appreciate this. Like when you have somebody else that you need to focus on, you kind of need to leave work at work. Um, and I knew I, I just, that with that job, I just could not leave it at work because it was so emotionally in, it was, I was very emotionally involved with it. Um, so anyway, I had to step back from it. Um, I still miss it. I must say I still miss it because I see some of my patients around sometimes and like we have a little chat and you know, they wonder what I'm up to these days or what else I'm doing with my life. Um, yeah, and so I'd always dabbled in craft, I would say. So I learned to knit when I was really young. I learned to sew when I was really young. Um, my grandparents would have fish nets out in the back and like I'd watch pop and dad learning, like, they would be like repairing the nets and knitting, knitting nets and that sort of thing. Um, you know, having a vegetable garden. My uncle always had animals that, you know, so he raised his own animals for food kind of thing. So I've always been, um, I've always been involved with that. And so when I decided to get into craft, again, being the perpetual student, I decided that I wanted to go to school and, learn, I guess, more intensely about craft. And so I went to the Anna Templeton Center um, through College of the North Atlantic. I did their program there, a two-year program. I stretched it out into three years, again, because I had a small child and I just, the program was so intense that to do it justice, I needed more time. So I stretched it over three years. Um, and through that program, I discovered um, seal skin and seal skin being one of the few materials that we can source here in Newfoundland locally. And I feel like most craftspeople understand, um, have a very keen sense of what it's like to source materials, especially on a, an island such as Newfoundland. I mean, yes, we're like, we're modern culture, we'll say, like it is a fairly modern city, but it's still really challenging to get materials. And a lot of them have to come from far away away and so when you're ordering something online you're ordering blind and I was finding like at least you know 30 to 40 percent of the time what I was ordering online just wasn't what I had hoped or wanted it to be whereas if I could get something locally which was the seal skin and sometimes seal leather it was what I expected it to be um, and so then I just started focusing and then I started just learning more about the seal hunt and what it meant historically and um, other cultures and peoples who were uh, a part of it and then you know also at the same time because my little guy was growing up around this I'd be in my my studio space and he'd come down and he'd he'd help me out like you know as much as like a five six seven year old can so if I needed to like punch holes in something he was like all about swinging a hammer at a chisel and punching a hole in something for me you know what I mean <laughs> I think uh it's very nice that relationship you have with your son that like he's growing these like craft environment and like 
And the other day we were talking and you said that like you're teaching him how to use a sewing machine, which was uh, very interesting because like I always wanted to learn how to use a sewing machine when I was younger. And like my grandma was like, you're not touching my sewing machine because you're going to break it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <see> her anxiety. <laughs> so like this sharing of craft and craft skills, like I think it's something very intrinsic of the craft community like we always sharing uh what we know and we're trying to learn more not only through courses but like through conversations and day-to-day -day life uh how do you how do you see that sharing in terms of like how did it benefit you and how do you do you move that forward i think it's vital like if we don't share information about what we do and how we do it it does nothing to keep like if we don't share it it doesn't stay relevant and it doesn't stay interesting so i mean yes i teach my son i share with him what i know because whether he uses it later in life or not but at least then he'll have an appreciation later in life when he does see something handmade that he knows that there was a significant time and energy investment to learn how to do whatever this thing was is in front of him with respect to other craftspeople um I can't think of a time where I've ever refused to share knowledge with another craftsperson, whether if, if they were doing leather work or working with fur, if even if it was a different medium altogether and they were just curious about how leather worked because maybe they wanted to incorporate it into a project. I don't think I've ever not shared something with somebody. Um, one, because I, I'd love for people to share with me again going back to being the perpetual student like i just want to know all sorts of things about all kinds of things all the time so for me sharing is really like i just i want like i want to know but i also feel like you know for for the sake of reciprocity if i don't share with somebody then how can i expect somebody to, to share with me right and yeah and like i just i don't i don't see the relevance of protectionism i don't see how that's helpful yeah well, i think that that's very interesting because uh when we we are talking about craft like we're talking about secular millennial techniques that like uh although craft is moving towards a contemporary v version today the techniques we use are still the same that people use seven eight hundred years ago yeah. uh so uh in terms of sharing I think that that's the only way that you can keep traditions alive. Yeah, that's a very good point. You're absolutely right about that. Because if you're right, if they wouldn't, if they weren't shared, they would just have stayed where they were in whatever place in history that it happened. So in that connection of like sharing and making, uh, how do you move your work forward? I know that like you're a big advocate for for the seal industry and like the the historical importance of that and and that's something that is also worth sharing because there's a lot of people that doesn't understand the the reasons behind the seal hunt and and they want to to be accusing and pointing fingers to to something that like is a secular tradition and is is a vital part of so many communities, especially in Canada and Northern Canada. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do you see that, uh, that sharing and not sharing that kind of information changes the, the way the craft industry that benefits from the seal hunt uh, moves, moves forward? Well, sure. Well, so how, do I, how do I frame this? Because it's, like, it's such a big, it's such a, like a significantly large idea. So we'll just, I'll talk about uh, SEAL in the context of my life. So, so from my own perspective, SEALing is a community-based activity. It happens in smaller communities. It doesn't happen in like large capital cities of, any, like, of the country, for example. It doesn't happen in um, border towns with the U.S. It, do, like, it doesn't happen in places where... The, it doesn't happen in places that are easily accessible by, from the rest of the world. And Newfoundland, believe it or not, is one of those places that's not easily accessible to the rest of the world. Like, it takes significant energy and money to get here in the first place. Like, when you drive out of St. John's, you're only going one way. 
you're only going west. Like you might go a little bit south, you might go a little bit north, but you're still like, you're not getting very far. You're, when you're driving out of St. John, you're only going west. So it, like, it is like we're right on the edge of the world. And so when the seal pond happens, it's like it's a time of year historically where you know, our winters can be pretty rough. And it's a time of year historically when fresh meat just it, it came to us. Fresh food came to us before any other type of fresh food was going to happen. Because if you plant anything here, you're lucky if it comes up before like the end of July or August, mm -hmm. if you're lucky. And so like the historical relevance of a food source is incredibly important. I think right now in contemporary cultures, a lot of the uh, groups or people who are anti-sealing only see it as a, as a, as a fashion, um, a fashion item. Mm -hmm. And sure, it's pretty, it's gorgeous. But as a textile, it's also really practical. So it's like, it's everything that a smart textile would aim to be. It's water repellent. The fur works one way. So if, you know, when you line it up properly and you get rained on it or snowed on, it just sort of falls away in the direction of the fur. So, and it can be, it can be warm. Now the, it does need to be lined in order to maximize the warmth. But that's no big deal because just about any material needs to be lined in order to maximize warmth. If you treat it properly, it'll last for years and years and years and years. And I have items in my house that are seal skin that maybe I don't treat as properly as I should, like pillows, for example. And they've survived dogs chewing on them. They've survived babies barfing on them. They've survived like being tossed around the house, like throw pillows, because that's what they are. You know, like it just, it's incredibly durable. And regardless of what I've spilled on it, because sometimes it's been red wine spilled on it, I can just, I can clean it easily and it goes back to being as beautiful as it was before. And the food source is amazing in itself itself. It's full of iron, it's full of like all the omegas that we need. It's full of like the really good fatty acids. It's full of, it's just it, like, it's a really nutrient dense and appropriate food for a time of year when fresh food is scarce. Like it's one of those things that's regenerative. Um, heart health, diabetes health, and when, when the oil has been rendered, one, it's a really great nutraceutical, but it can also be used to fuel lamps. Um, historically, people have used it to, um, yeah, to fuel oil lamps, and I've heard um, incidents around the, around the province where people have used it to power um, furnaces and, and uh, generators for, uh, to run businesses, like to operate lights and heat systems. So with a little more ex exploration, the oil can be a lot, um, I guess, more developed as a, like a hydraulic fuel, or not fuel, but hydraulic uh, lubricant, for example. And so if, like, if seal oil as a hydraulic lubricant was spilled out into the ocean, it wouldn't be as big a deal as some other hydraulic lubricants spilled out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I guess for me, like not being able to share that information ensures viability of something that's incredibly relevant to small communities such as my own. And it's also very interesting because it's not only that knowledge of the use of it, but it is the uh, cultural knowledge uh, that is shared too. So like the way that uh, the indigenous archers in Canada have been using CO skin and like for the past millennia and and like the importance of that transition of this shared knowledge and the importance of that for their culture is extremely important just like it is for any other type of craft as we talked before that like if the knowledge of traditional techniques were kept inside their own communities, like they would be dead today and we, we wouldn't know. Exactly. Yeah. So go ahead. Cause we've been at, um, well, you and I together have been at events where there've been, um, textile artists from different parts of the country come together. And one of the things I love about those gatherings, those events is the sharing of knowledge so you know i'm i do something a little bit different than what some of those other artists might do 
and they asked me how I managed to, to get that particular technique to work. And so I share it. And then likewise, I say, well, this is a really neat thing that you've done with your work. How did you do that? And then they share it. And there's also like, I'm not afraid of sharing what I've done because there's also this sort of recognition that, yes, they'll use it, but they won't copy what I've done with it. They'll find a different way to, to work the technique so that it becomes their own. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, a lot of people today that does embroidery, embroidery has been coming back like big time. Like if you go online, like everyone's doing embroidery. Uh -huh. uh, the same techniques has been used, as I said, since the beginning of times, like even before the medieval times, like embroidery was like, a, a, sign, a, a sign of power and was considered like women's work and like and that evolved and like it changed uh, and people are still using the same techniques today and but they're doing their own thing and I think that that's the importance of sharing the knowledge between between craftspeople mm -hmm. uh, we can just like be close in our own communities and not opening that up to, to the rest of the world uh, so with the advent of technology and like the whole world wide web over there, that like sharing has became an easier thing. Uh, how do you see that impacting like the the craftspeople of the future? Like how do you see that they will behave in terms of like understanding traditional and sharing knowledge? Uh, from where I sit and the people that I interact with. I don't know if it changes it a whole whole lot. I mean, it definitely changes the forum and it changes the platform, but I don't think from where I sit, it changes the intention of sharing. Um, this type of conversation that you are you and I are having virtually, you know, well, you know, chalk it up to the global pandemic, but we can't sit face to face and have a coffee. It doesn't change our intention of sharing ideas and, um, propelling an idea that sharing is a good thing and we need to continue to do it. However, if you, if I want, if I was curious about an embroidery technique that you were doing, I feel like I, it would be easier for me to get what your technique was if we were side by side and in person with each other, because the camera doesn't pick up on certain nuances of um, practicality. And I say practicality meaning like, hand movements mm -hmm. sometimes that gets a little lost but i don't know like i don't think the intention of sharing is affected as such by um virtual interaction so in, in terms of like the sharing the ability uh like i'll i've seen a lot of like online classes happening for for different techniques in in textiles in ceramic and in jewelry making and, and so on uh, so as you said like a lot of people are watching those videos and they're trying to do that at home or in their studios and, and they kind of get like frustrated because they're not achieving the technique and oh, wow. and That's then the thing i feel like like you can't master something in a couple of weeks for sure you can't master something in a couple of years i mean honestly let's face it right <laughs> So uh, I think that it, it's relevant what you're saying that like, although like sharing is easier through, through like the internet and, and through like, I, I can see what someone in Australia is doing right now. Which is so wild, it's so cool, right? Yeah, and, but then again, like, I think that what we need to remember is that although this kind of sharing is important, the other type of sharing that you said, like side by side and like seeing the hand movement and like, how do you hold the clay or how do you manipulate the clay or how do you hold the fabric? That That is something that like, uh, it's only like in an in-person situation that can actually be shared. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in that sense, like, do you think that after this whole pandemic crisis that we are having right now, because people are having more time and like watching more videos of how to make things on, at home do you think they're going to be seeking more like classes and workshops and like seeking more like yeah. circles of people to i do i absolutely do 
because you're right. I mean, it's all over. It's all over. I follow Instagram as sort of my, my social media platform. The others, I just, Instagram is kind of, if I'm going on social media, Instagram is where I'm going to go. Cause I just, I enjoy the platform the most. And you're right from what I see, like there's so much interest out there now from learning different craft techniques to learning how to build stools and desks to learning how to bake bread or cooking or foraging or, you know, any number of different techniques or uh, philosophies about self-sustenance. So when we're allowed to be interactive again, like physically interactive again, I think there's going to be a, like a huge surge in people seeking that that physical practical knowledge of how to do the things and i think it's going to be wonderful like i feel like if you can find a silver lining in a global pandemic it's the the um the new perceived relevance of craft and being and practical knowledge and practical knowledge meaning like hands-on how do you do something physically with your own two hands how do you make these things work to do something for you yeah, I feel like there's going to be a huge surge of that. Well, it's already happening. For sure. I think that uh, we will see a big change, in, especially in the craft community. And like the, I don't want to call them outsiders, but the people that appreciate craft and, and never try their hands on making craft. I think that's going to change a lot because they're going to try to understand more, which uh, will increase what we perceive as the value of craft for Absolutely, yeah i know when i I've, I've taught a couple of classes in the past couple of years and one of the interesting things that came out of teaching those classes because there's all you know different walks come into that class and they all have different expectations and you know some people have I've gotten some feedback from other crafts people because they were worried that if i was teaching people how to make their own leather belt then they wouldn't want to buy a leather belt from anybody else but what actually came out of that class was, yeah, some people are going to go make their own leather belt. But then there's a number of other people who recognize how challenging it is to make, you know, just a leather belt and don't ever want to do it again in their entire life and are now totally cool with spending the money on a good leather belt. For sure. So nice. I think that's going to be great for, for the craft community in general, especially as right. you said, like we live in an island that we have craft as pretty much the base of the society here. Like I moved here and I can see that very clear. The craft is like, is a very important part of the, the community here. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to change a lot. And uh, thanks to people like you and like all the other crafts maker that like, although they are bounded at home, like they, they keep producing that and they keep putting out there that like the value of craft and the importance that craft has in our daily lives. Yeah. I mean, we're fortunate here in Newfoundland that we still have living memory of a lot of heritage skills. Because you can go to like a, a number of places, even across Canada, and they no longer have living memory of heritage skills because it's been that many generations since people have actually practiced it that it's more challenging for them to access it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, I think here, uh, the community here has like these, they understand the importance of craft and what that means for society. And I think that after we are allowed to socialize again, uh, yeah. the value of craft will, will increase for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's all thanks to, to the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of like what people are making these days. Yeah, and also people like yourself who, are, who you know, want to help share, who want to like put together the platform and the, the mode for sharing. Because like this conversation is kind of what you and I are talking about right now, from my perspective, wouldn't have made it out onto the big wide web if you weren't instigating the conversation and the platform to help get the idea and the message out there to share with somebody else. You know what I mean? So Bruno, thank you so much for like doing this, for putting all of us together to have these conversations. And thank you for taking part in the conversation and, and thanks every single craftsperson that has been part of those conversations. Every single and, one of them. And I, I hope that more and more would come and like we can have those amazing talks uh, about whatever they want to talk about because <laughs> that's what sharing is. Like we talk about things that is important to us until someone else thinks that it's important to them too. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thank, 
Thank you so much, Claire. I hope you have an amazing day and I talk to you soon. Yes, talk to you soon. Virtual hugs. Virtual hugs. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.